Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is artist Chuck Patton. Chuck, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you, Terrence. I'm really glad to be here. Chuck, you are one of my uh, favorite artists. When I w really got into comics in the, uh, the 1980s, you were working on the Justice League, and it was around the time of the Justice League Detroit, and, and to me that will always hold a very special place in my heart. Um, oh. And you had sort of that, that tough time of going from the classic lineup of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman into a whole new team that was, I guess, really trying to shake up the, the market a little bit and, and get the Justice League a little bit more uh, readers. You also had the, uh, the opportunity to design and redesign some characters. So when you're working on a book like that and you know, you've got your regular deadline, how do you sort of find the time to you know, come up with a new costume design for Vixen or maybe come up with a, a new character like Vibe and still get your pages done? <laughs> I just came up with a very flippant answer, which I don't know, it would be not PG enough, but, and it would, it would really have been flippant. The truth is, um, <clears throat> honestly, to quote Don Heck, I was full of a lot of beans, which meant I had a lot of energy. I was happy to be there. I had um, reached a, um, it was a goal that I've had since I was five years old. Um, probably younger than that, but five is the best number I can give you, but I've been drawing all my life. And so here I am now at the, that age, I think I turned 27 and thought I was over the hill. But um, the thing is, is that I was just so happy to be there, to be this artist. And so in a way, it was great to be thrown on the bus and say, now you're driving the bus, kid. You got to find a new route. And uh, oh, yeah, that route that you've been studying all your life, we're going to bypass that. You got to go into new ground. So I went in knowing I can draw Superman, I can draw Batman. But when the curve came that those guys are going to be taken out, it was a new muscle. It's like you had this muscle that you were ready for. And then they say, no, you're not going cross country, you're going mountain climbing. So it's like, oh, gee. So I had to adjust that muscle, if that makes any sense. Um, my enthusiasm helped. The, the flipping answer I was going to say was copious amounts of drugs, but that's, I've never done that. So it wasn't really, it was really just gut and, and gonzo um, love of comics. And so when I got thrown in and there were times when I would literally go to district down and go, you sure you got the right guy? <laughs> you sure I should do this? And he would just constantly go, hey kid, you got the job. You know, he always put the time. He was the rabbi that we, none of us ever had before. And now he's our rabbi. Um, and uh, he was our teacher. And so Dick would always give me the faith that I could do it. And I had the responsibility of doing it. So I didn't have time to sit there. I don't know how to do this. Um, I just delved into my comics and looked at the things I liked. And I knew when I got Dixon, it was easy because as much as I really admired the original artist for it, Bob Ostner, uh, the costume was just honestly appalling. <laughs> it was just, and even Jerry admitted it. So it was easy to look at Vixen and go, oh, we can do better than this. <laughs> you know? Especially as we talked, and we talked earlier about how um, the power of a good interview, a good interview is to listen. And I've always been a pretty good listener. And as Jerry was telling me, I saw that the essence of what he wanted wasn't being addressed. And, you know, she was a superhero, but it was like, no, this is an African. Um, this is an African woman who went through a trial of combat and all these other things and horrible things that happened to her. And now she has this tantum totem and this thing gave her power to empower herself. So I knew right there, we got to do something that's going to strike, strike out, that's going to really stand out. And also her name's Vixen and she looked nothing like a Vixen. She was thinking she was in blue and yellow colors, which was Oh my God, I don't think, and this isn't the 60s anymore. We're in the deep part of the 70s. So it's like, that's not working. And so I looked at Wolverine. Wolverine was the man, if you wanted Savage Hero. It was either Wolverine or Timberwolf, kind of the same guy. So I looked at those things. So in other words, I used comics to teach me. And since I was a big aficionado or in other words, fan of comics, it was easy to go in and go, all right, I want this and I want that. With Vibe, there was a part of me that wanted to make, and I've never told anybody this, but I wanted Vibe to be like an urban Captain America, a Captain Marvel. And not the Captain Marvel, Marvel, but Captain Marvel Shazam. Um, the idea of this young guy getting all this power, and he's still a young guy, but he has this power. That was the essence of, of Captain Marvel for me. And so I wanted something that would be striking, also street worthy, street worthy being, you know, because he was a dancer and all that. 
And that was hard. That was probably the hardest character because I really didn't relate that well to, to break dancing. And here, and this is my assignment, make a break dancer a superhero. And I certainly didn't want to make him look like uh, Dazzler. I feel like I may have, didn't quite get it right, but I know in my heart, that's what I was going for. Redesigning steel was easier. It just takes steel. It means basically a Captain America ripoff. So, or whoever else, well, Captain America is always the pinnacle. So you got the shield and, you know, and then the original steel. So it's just do a variation of it. I was never really that crazy about him because of that. I wanted, I would love, I mean, I wanted to make him our version of Colossus. So I was really influenced to me again by comics. Um, the hit comics. My favorite comics at the time would have been, you know, between Titans and X-Men, X-Men being stronger. And so I went to, you know, a lot of the writers have been Marvel people anyway. So a lot of the dynamics at the time of DC was how can we compete with Marvel? So that was really the edict when we did the younger Justice League was how to make this much more open to an X-Men audience. Uh, same way as the Titans did. The original Titans was a lot more sugary you know, sugar-coated and more like the Archies than it was the, uh, the Titans that it became. And that edge we wanted to bring to Justice League, that, that stood, stood out to me. So it was basically going, it was like doing my homework. I went back into comics to learn comics. You talk about how you're, and I believe you did a, a, a handful of maybe some backup stories in comics before you got the Justice League and, and sort of being new to uh, the industry to get handed what is one of the flagship titles uh, in all of comics. The, you know, the, the big uh, seven are always considered to be the, in the Justice League and there you are, your first real big assignment. Um, and, and where some of those stories are, are a lot of fun, you're, you're handling the, the Mars uh, Earth War, um, which kind of changes the status quo. And, and the fact that you're able to take a character like Vixen, and, and this to me speaks of the impact of your run on, on Justice League, is that after you've made your changes to Vixen, after you and Jerry Conway have adapted the character for, I guess, the new decade of the 80s, uh, she ends up being a lead character in the very successful Suicide Squad uh, series. And then, I mean, gosh, she's back, uh, she's on TV uh, yeah. as a, a character on Legends of uh, Tomorrow. Um, right. So again, I don't think that would have happened if it wasn't for uh, your love of comics and that uh, idea that you're kind of combining Wolverine and Timberwolf into uh, this, this badass character uh, <laughs> who doesn't really look good in blue or gold. <laughs> Well, again, when you say Dixon, I don't know. I mean, that's a red fox, <laughs> you know? So I wanted something that was going to be, which again, made sense, you know? And also I wanted something that would be paying homage to um, our African heritage. So that was important to bring the earth tones in. Um, all those things that was just, I was just sort of, I, I made the analogy of being thrown on the bus and now I'm the driver as well as the passenger. And it really was that. So I was kind of excited, but also going, where am I going? Where am I going? And, um, and thank God I had older guys, the, the classic artists around me to be helpful. Don Heck was a lot more helpful um, than most people realize in pointing out to me, don't let this, you know, it's a job. That was the other thing. He helped me really see this and become a professional and not just let the fanboy freak out. The professional has to turn in a certain amount of pages. The professional has to interpret the story this way. Um, you don't, you, you shouldn't come in with this attitude of uh, grandiosity. I came in with an attitude of gratitude and that's what he um, recognized and really helped uh, hone that as he was passing the baton. And that was really cool too. Uh, that really helped me get into it. I was always a fan of Justice League. That was the other thing. It wasn't, I mean, as much as I was always a DC guy. <laughs> I grew up on DC Comics. I, there wasn't a DC comic I did not have or didn't know. So even when we were talking about who to bring into the league, Lynn Wien and I were sitting in the office and throw out names. And it was almost like we were doing the precursor to who's who. As I would say, hey, what about this guy? No, we can't use that guy. I wanted to bring Metamorpho in. And unfortunately, they already grabbed him for Outsiders. I always loved Metamorpho. I loved that guy. I, don't, I can't explain why. I like him more than Plastic Man. <laughs> so, he was, he was, I guess, in my generation's Plastic Man. So it was a lot of characters like that that I related to and unfortunately was not allowed to work with that I wanted to bring. I really wanted to do the classic Justice League. I had in my mind what to do. And then, again, like I said, getting it and then being told, guess what? They're not going to be around long. You got to bring in new guys. 
and um, me really going through a crisis of, oh my, I don't know enough to bring new stuff in this. So I'm really led by what Jerry wanted to do. And um, putting in what I saw were filling in holes that I thought weren't there. I love the exclusive or the, um, I love when we brought in different people. I love bringing in people who were like me, brown skin people, uh, different people, even Gypsy. I, I was the one that told Jerry, we got to really make her a Romany. She really has to be a real Gypsy, not just somebody calling herself Gypsy. Even though she was clearly catering to the uh, Kitty Pride category, but I really wanted to bring the mysticism. And that was the thing, we had a hard time to say, is it mysticism or some sort of issue of mutants or what? And I think that was probably the failure of us to really nail that. But in my mind, I wanted her to be somewhat quasi mystical. And I love whatever I read about the gypsy culture that to bring that into it. Um, so there was a lot that I give him a lot of credit for listening to me when I said, hey, let's try this instead of that. And uh, and then the part that I felt, oh my God, he's listening to me. Why me? <laughs> this guy's got thirty years experience. I've only come in five minutes. I just got here. <laughs> you know, I, I'm really grateful for that. I guess well, I can go on. <laughs> well, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and, and you know, you you mentioned some of the characters that you brought in. I, I was thinking of Dale Gunn and. Um, <laughs> Uh, Dale Gunn was one of those great supporting characters, and, and some people may have implied that maybe he was based on you a little bit. Um, but, you know, when you're creating some of those supporting characters and building this new universe, um, it's got to be uh, kind of rewarding to be able to have that free reign. And it seems like Jerry was, was leaning on you. It was, it was that collaboration, that team, rather than here's the script and just execute it for me. So was he letting you do sort of the Marvel style, or was he giving you that full script and, and kind of putting out all the beats for you? When we did the annual, it was more like a, a kind of a, it was a Marvel style. <clears throat> um, the breakdown was a Marvel, Marvel style. And then he would go back in and, and re-script it. Um, I enjoyed that. Uh, it really was a flex of muscles <clears throat> of uh, everything Dick was teaching us in class. All of a sudden, now I got to bring it into this book. And it, again, it was a swerve. <laughs> I was ready to kind of go into Metropolis and now we're, Oh God, we're doing Detroit, <laughs> and um, that's my fault because I said Detroit. So again, it was it was it, at the beginning it was very exciting, and I had visions of what I wanted to do. The initial thing was to make Detroit bigger than life, and that you would see this urban sprawl, this urban decay, but underneath was this spooky super science stuff that nobody knew about it. And I wanted to tap that and make that why Detroit was going to be, as, as, as I learned later, is a great name for it. It's like it was a nexus of trouble. I wanted to make Detroit a nexus of trouble, like New York has become, or like uh, in the DC universe would be Metropolis of Gotham. I wanted Detroit to have that feeling. And from there on, I think that's where we kind of went and didn't really come out that way. And it became more script and less collaboration, uh, less talking back and forth or me getting a, a plot from him and going, why are we in Russia? <laughs> you know, why are we doing this? Where is the super villains? It just got, I got a lot more questions than I got answers, or at least, um, yeah, I had a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. And it be quickly became less interesting for me because I was hoping to grow and learn. And I felt like, well, you're learning how to turn in, you meet deadlines but you're not growing as an artist where you felt that collaborative effort that got kind of stymied later. And I don't know why. Um, even years later, as we, he and I met at uh, one of the conventions, um, I think it's just, you know, we had different paths. That's the best way to say it. And it just didn't come together. You mentioned the, uh, the trip to Russia. As I recall, that was um, the villain with the, the, the kitar. <laughs> yeah. Which, it was uh, based off, I think, the Fiddler or some guy like that. I made I made it that because I think I was still, no, I think I, by that time I had moved to the California and looking at a lot of um, night flight television. I remember seeing Edgar Winter playing that. Oh, that's kind of cool. And I and that was the other thing. I wanted to really jack kickstart. I was going to say jack, uh, and I lost the word. Um, but I really wanted to kickstart JLA Detroit into this. This is like X-Men and X like Titans. This is the new era. We're coming into the 80s. It's got to be hipper. So I wanted this villain, even though he was based on a 1940s guy, I wanted this to reflect what's happening. You know, this is like a mad mod guy for the, for the era. And because we weren't talking back and forth, 
that didn't come across to me. So it was kind of difficult to grasp and became just an assignment and said something where I thought, oh, we're building a real villain here. When I created the cadre, when we did the cadre in the in the initial four, that was probably the last time we really had back and forth. The cadre was somebody I wanted to become because having them go against the royal the royal flush gang or any of the old villains with, with the new crew was too soon. And I really wanted them to feel, again, bring some gravitas to them. So they needed their own villains. So it was, was not better than go, let's go cosmic. Let's go some these creepy cosmic kind of guys. Unfortunately, it tied in too much with the crisis. <laughs> it was sneaking up behind us and realize, oh no, we got other cosmic guys. This guy is nothing compared to the anti-monitor. And it was just bad timing. But at that time at DC, that was that really was the catalyst why DC gave us free reigns to change JLA. The regular characters, most of them were being killed off, re, re, or not killed off, but reimagined. So it was going to change as it did, the status quo of their myths and backgrounds. So guys we are used to, villains like the Key or uh, Hector Hammond, or, they're going to change. And I saw that, but I also did not see how our JLA was going to fit in because the plans for Christ was, was, an, was enormous. And it was already, like you said, changed the status quo. We lost the Flash. We lost uh, Superman. We lost Batman. We lost Wonder Woman. Um, without those core people, who's the Justice League? So it was, it was an interesting time, interesting conundrum. It's, it's got to be difficult as a creator when you've got this, this mandate from editorial. The folks, uh, you know, running the, the, the bean factory, they're telling you, you know, how to put the cans on the shelf. Uh, it's got to be tough because, you know, you want to tell stories, but it has to fit into this bigger uh, universal story. Um, and I guess it would make it tough for you to kind of build that world. And, you know, we were talking before we started recording about that four issue with the cadre, yeah. that, that beautiful yeah. overlapping cover, four covers that turn into one poster. Uh, that was when I started to read and that really grabbed my attention as, you know, a young teenager reading comics. It was just so exciting and so much fun. Now you talk about how daunting it is. You ended up following in the footsteps of George Perez twice, once on the Justice League and then again on the last four original issues of New Teen Titans before they started reprinting yeah. the direct sales book on the new stand edition. So when you're working on those four issues of the, the New Teen Titans, how much flexibility do you have? I mean, obviously Marv Wolfman knows the characters inside and out, but is he giving you the chance to kind of express yourself through storytelling or is he giving you, again, it's that DC style where every page is broken down at the panels and you're sort of executing it as best you can? Big difference between JLA and Titans was when uh, I, you know, when Jerry and I came up with JLA Detroit, we had dinner, we sat down, literally mapped out. Yeah, I think we spent two or three hours a couple of times. One time was at his house. So it was a real like war meeting. When I got Titans, Marv, Marv wrote down on a napkin, my basic start setup with Raven in another dimension. And because he was juggling so many books, the conversation with that napkin was so energizing and so empowering. In other words, he, he trusted me. And as soon as I started babbling, he goes, George trusts you. And I only got to see George in person once when I first got the job on JLA. And that was the first thing out of his mouth is you're going to do it. You know, and so Marv saying, George trusts you. I trust you was almost like a shot of adrenaline that I missed in JLA. And so even the plotting from that napkin, Marv and I just talked. And Marv said, I'd like to see this happen. Let's do that. And I go, what could he do this? Yeah, I want to see it. Can you play with it. And me hearing that was like, oh my God, this is what I missed. This is what I wanted. So to answer your question, I got a lot of, I was, I was allowed a lot of input. And I just went, I just channeled George. I just thought, what would George do here? Let's try this. Even if I didn't know how to do it, I tried it because I knew George would go that way. Whether it looked like him or not, it was just, I wanted that spirit. And I felt akin, I felt the characters. I knew Starfire, I enjoyed. And even though I was primarily drawing, it's around, it's around Cyborg. I really enjoyed the Raven stuff. That's why I thought it was great when he gave me the description. I wish I kept that napkin because when I tell people, they go, are you nuts? No, no. I've, I've had a couple of times when someone gave me something like that. One was, this was a gift. 
And the second time I got something like that was kind of a nightmare. <laughs> and, and unless you ask me what it is, I won't go into what it is. But the, the Titan stuff, I was given a lot of, a lot of trust, a lot of, uh, allowed a lot of input, which again was a lot of fun. It kind of broke my heart that I didn't get to do more. I really wanted to do more. I really loved the characters. And what I felt again too, that was the other thing was that with JLA Detroit, I didn't feel like I could really impose the characterizations. I know I wasn't getting the characterizations I wanted to do. And in Titans, I knew who they were. You knew what Cyborg was, you know what he's gonna do. You knew what Raven was gonna do. You know what Nightwing's gonna do. Um, you know what Wonder Girl's gonna do. You know, even Gar was easier to deal with. And um, cause I, I don't like doing crazy goofy characters for goofy characters sake. So Gar was, but the, th the fact he was Beast Boy that I can relate to from the Doom Patrol helped. So it really was uh, night and day. It's it's funny because uh, that story does focus on Vic Stone and he's he's getting yeah. uh, f I guess skin colored uh, yeah. pieces for his cybernetics so he doesn't have to have the the armored pieces and it's heartbreaking when when everything fails for him uh, and you're really able to capture that and that's why uh, for me as a comic reader it was disappointing that you moved into animation I'm sure it was rewarding for you because I see behind you that you have an Emmy Award. <laughs> Um, and I understand that that was for your work on Spawn, which was an animated series based on Todd McFarlane's uh, image comic character. So can you talk about the similarities between uh, animation, maybe storyboarding and storytelling in comics? I hate to do this to you, but we only have about five minutes left. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I knew this was gonna come. So I'm gonna try to simplify it. One, and this is, came up recently with some other young artists on Twitter, Comics and storyboarding are two different things. The one thing they have in common is storytelling. Um, for me, with storyboarding, it is telling film. You're telling it with film language. You're using the film medium. Television is a lot harder than just doing feature. Um, so there is a very strict structure that you have to work with. While with comics, there's you can, you can go all over the place. You can be this tight, you can be this Verbose, you can be like Musicelli, make it look simple, but very, very, I mean, he was very cinematic in his choices. And, but it still isn't the same as storyboarding. Storyboarding is working, you're doing a lot of drawings to illustrate one single moment, time. While with comics, we can, we have control of time, like we are, uh, like we're, we're, like we're, uh, um, uh, I can't think of his name now, um, the Lord of Time in, at Marvel. Um, but you have that control. And so that's the big difference. Um, if you're able to walk and use both those rules, then you're, 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 you're going to be rewarded. I've been very grateful that um, my work in comics allowed me to learn storyboarding so that I can do that. And Gunning on the Spawn um, was unique because we were asked right off the bat, don't board this the way you would do a normal show, a, a Batman show or a Marvel show. We want this to be unique. So we went more cinematic and meaning that we, again, went to the language of film. We were looking at, I went from everywhere from uh, anime to German noir to express spawn and had a ball doing it, enjoyed it. And it's been kind of been my template ever since. Um, I wasn't allowed to do that a lot in comics because of time, because of the nature of the job. I only got to do bits of that, but while when storyboarding, I got to just immerse myself. So that's the big difference. And, you know, they're both different disciplines. A lot of people are gonna mix up, what do you do when you can do the other? No. Although the guys who brought me in animation were guys, some of the guys who brought me in animation were guys who came out of comics and learned that. But the rest I learned by working on the job and also becoming a filmmaker, editing, directing, um, supervising the sounds, supervising the music, um, as well as working on the palettes and working with the artists. There's so much going into it. It's definitely a team effort. Well, in comics, just you and a pencil and paper or a stylus now and a Cintiq or a tablet. It's much more solitary. solitary. Now, you, you mentioned the, the Cintiq uh, and I'm imagining uh, the, in animation, uh, maybe it's going to be easier for you to work on a digital platform rather than 
uh, pencil and board. Uh, in the minute or so that we have left, uh, are you able to do, because I've seen some commission work that you've done on, on social media, and I know that you've mm -hmm. done some work for uh, Power Comics recently. Are you, able, are you working digitally, or are you doing the old traditional you know, ink and board on the, uh, the, the page? Honestly, I've gone to, I got ink and board on the page. Primarily because uh, I, um, it feels more comfortable. It feels more natural. I've seen guys do things on digitally, which kind of does that, but it doesn't give you that same thrill. It also makes you make decisions right now. I think with digitally, you allow so many um, variations and you can go for a perfection. And I think that can be a crutch. Um, if you can do this cover 15 different times, how do you know that maybe you got it right the first time? I just recently did a cover, well, last year <clears throat> for the Aquaman 80th anniversary. And I did like 10 templates, um, 10 roughs on paper for the uh, for DC to decide. The joke is they picked the first one I roughed out. <laughs> and so, but, but I gave them 10 variations because I just kept going and going. I, and, and I realized if I was doing this digitally, I, you know, I probably would have got this perfect, perfect shot, but it wouldn't let my, allow me to go to my gut. And really, these are just tools. They're not the real thing. Real creativity comes from up here in this hand. Doesn't matter what tool you use. Chuck, that's probably a good spot for us to end. We have run out of time. I want to thank you so much for taking time out to talk with me today. No problem, and really enjoyed it. Glad to have done it. I'd like to thank everyone at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.